everybody, so here's the video I promised to walk you through how to analyze the data from our uric acid assay. So just for starters, a quick tour of uh, the uh, process I went through with these samples, right? So we plated out our samples on one of these uh, micro titer plates, and in the first uh, uh, set of wells here, I actually indicated this over along the side on the paper, I pipetted in a known quantity of uric acid, so from no uric acid up to a 20 microliter volume of a solution that uh, contained two nanomoles per microliter. And then of course you uh, added in your samples across the rest of the tray. Uh, and then I added in a solution containing the uricase and the uh, probe. And this is kind of how everything looked uh, when I brought it up to the uh, microplate reader. Here is our microplate reader. So it's this box over on the side. Might not look like much, but it has a lot of instrumentation inside of it. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. And we we're really excited to get it uh, just a little over a year ago. So I put the plate uh, into uh, this uh, uh, holder and then it gets slurped into the machine. And uh, I set the machine to incubate it at 37 degrees for uh, 30 minutes. So that higher temperature will speed up the conversion to allantoic acid. Uh, and then had it read at the appropriate wavelength. And here's what the output actually looks like from the software that will read the plate. Uh, so it's kind of nicely color coded. And then uh, this generates a file that can be exported to Excel. And just so you can see it for posterity, here's what the plate looked like uh, after it came out of Microplate Reader. So clearly there's been more development across uh, many of the samples here. So that's the um, uh, what that all looks like. So here's the Excel spreadsheet that gets exported. Um, and you'll see a link to this on Canvas. Um, I ran one initial test, we're going to ignore that, and uh, so there will be two tabs, one for the plate from the morning lab and then one for the plate from the evening lab. In general, we can kind of ignore a lot of the information that's up here, but this kind of gives us a track record for what happened to the plate, including uh, you know what wavelength uh, the plate was read at. Um, but then uh, below that is a map that shows us the absorbances across all of the wells that contain the standards and the samples. So what I generally like to do is underneath this map, um, I'm going to pull out the measurements and I'm going to kind of put the pairs of measurements, right, because we put each sample into two wells um, into a set of columns, and then I'm going to conduct some follow-up calculations uh, with those. So we'll fast forward through the uh, a lot of the copying and pasting, and then I'll uh, pick up again with uh, some steps after that. So the first thing I'm going to do here is record the average absorbance across these samples. And then uh, for my standards, I can use the volume of standard that I added. The standard is at a concentration of two nanomoles per microliter to figure out the amount of uric acid that I added in each case. And so that's just going to be uh, multiplying the uh, standard concentration against the volume that I added. In this case, zero, so that's just going to be zero. Or I could also say two times zero for that cell. If I drag this down, that's going to give me the total amount of uric acid present in units of nanomoles. Okay. So the next step is going to be to generate a standard curve. So I'm just going to go up here and highlight the cell range, insert a scatter plot, and it's auto magically generated for me. And the first thing you'll notice in this scatter plot is we do have one point that is very much an outlier. It's actually this highest uh, concentration is a lot lower than uh, we would predict. Um, under other circumstances, I would need to rerun the entire assay. Um, here, we don't have that option. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to eliminate that point uh, from this graph. Then I'm going to add a trend line, as I'm sure you have done many a time lately. 
Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we can uh, go ahead and add in the equation and our squared value onto this graph. In general, I don't like doing this. I prefer putting that information inside of a figure legend, but uh, in this case, uh, this is not our, going to be part of our final process, so we don't really need to do that. Uh, and I'm going to show you another little trick, which is that uh, we can actually just calculate the slope and the intercept uh, here as well using the slope function. So we put in our y's, comma, x's. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. Okay, and you can just see here that yes, those do correspond with what's reported um, up in this plot. So the reason I have done that is I can then use these values to calculate the concentrations uh, in the samples where I know the absorbances. Uh, one other item of note, so a lot of our absorbances in our samples are much, much higher than the absorbance range of the standard curve. So uh, also if I were rerunning this procedure, I would perform a dilution uh, to ensure that my samples are within the range uh, of this standard curve. Um, along with that, you'll notice my R squared value in this case is 0.9832. Uh, for a lot of um, assays of this nature, uh, we, that's actually a low R squared value. Your R squared should be very, very close to one uh, so that you have very high certainty about the concentrations that you're measuring. But again, in this case, since we don't have the option to rerun this assay, uh, we'll work with what we've got. So now if I want to figure out the amount of my other samples, uh, all I need to do is take this absorbance and plug it into this equation, right? So I'm going to take uh, this value, I'm going to multiply it by my slope value, and then I'm going to add my intercept, which in this case is negative. And to um, extend this across all of the samples, I'm going to do one other step, which is I'm going to add in a set of dollar signs in front of these slope and intercept measures. And what that's going to do, if I just drop this down to one more cell, is it's going to freeze the reference cell uh, that's being used to make that calculation. Uh, so then I can go ahead and just uh, drag and drop that all the way through. So now uh, for the samples where uh, we are working with a subsample of FRAS, um, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to figure out the concentration uh, in your uh, subsample mass. So for that you're going to need to go back to our class data sheet right here uh, and uh, plug in the mass. Uh, in other cases where we're dealing with hemolymph samples, uh, you're going to process those uh, separately. In the long run, I'm going to actually find it most convenient to have these measurements uh, somewhere outside of where I'm doing all my calculations. So I'm just going to add some extra rows and I'm just going to relocate these measurements. And let's check those values, make sure they don't change. They stay the same. So that's helpful. Um, along with that, I'm actually going to add another column uh, here to the left um, so I can incorporate some additional information from our spreadsheet. So now if I go back over to the spreadsheet here, so started out with uh, our sample type, species, and ID number for the Cricut experiment where that's relevant. So I'm just going to copy this information and I'll paste it in uh, over here for this spreadsheet just so I know what sample is what type. Then I need to uh, figure out the mass of the subsample for cases where I was working with a subsample. So that's in uh, this column here, column F. So I'm just going to copy this information, <coughs> paste that into a column here I've labeled subsample mass. And one thing you'll notice is that uh, people have used different units for this. Um, some of these are in grams, some of these are in milligrams. So you are going to need to go through to convert uh, where appropriate between grams and milligrams. So uh, now we know the uh, total amount uh, in that subsample mass. Uh, we can use that uh, for our FRAS samples uh, to then calculate um, how much would be present in the total FRAS mass. So if we have, uh, you know, 43.7 nanomoles per 0.002 grams, 
that's our uh, concentration in the subsample. Uh, if we just multiply that by the total frass mass, uh, we can get the total uric acid produced in what units? Nanomoles. Okay. So our grams will cancel out if we are in grams. And so that's just going to be the amount in our subsample mass in grams multiplied by our total mass for those samples. And for those creating a figure uh, for our poster of uric acid, there will be one more step, right, of uh, then dividing by the duration uh, of uh, that treatment uh, for that cricket. If you are um, preparing this for a data summary, um, you can typically work with uh, just the uric acid concentrations across uh, sample types because we're only going to be able to calculate concentrations uh, for the volume samples uh, that we have. So here, uh, for example, where we have two hemolymph samples, so we have a total of uh, 18 uh, nanomoles per 5 microliters. Um, so uh, we can calculate our, our concentration. I'll just stick that out in another column here. Um, <clears throat> and actually, what I'll do is I'm going to insert a column before I calculate those total uric acid amounts. nanomoles per <clears throat> gram of sample. So now for our um, samples from hemolymph, we can actually convert this to the same units of nanomoles per gram uh, if you know that uh, one microliter is equivalent to one microgram. So that's also 0 0.001 grams. So five microliters is going to be equivalent to 0 0.005 grams. So here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that and I'm going to divide it by 0 0.005 grams. Okay. And uh, collectively then, um, that gets everything into units where if you are preparing a data summary uh, for this lab, you should now be able to compare the concentration of uric acid in the frass relative to the concentration of uric acid in the hemolymph uh, for both cockroaches uh, and crickets. And if you are in charge of a figure for the poster, I should also now be able to figure out the amount of uric acid excreted per day by these crickets. <laughs>